Okay. Well, you know, we decided today, Claudia, that we would uh, record a conversation, and neither of us knew what we were going to be talking about, did we? No, I still haven't a clue. Okay. So we've already had an interesting conversation this morning with a friend of ours, um, and I, I'll segue right into kind of combining several threads together. Uh, it got brought up in the earlier conversation. Um, it's, it's about energy. And then it's a bar about where energy comes from in dark energy. And how do we, as conscious, awake beings in a human form, I'm trying to get away from all the labels, conscious, awake beings in a human form, uh, <laughs> okay, how do we understand the nature of duality where we have light? on one side of the pole and dark on the other. And then we fracture it out a little further to organic light and organic dark versus inorganic light and inorganic dark, right? But either way that we're speaking of it, we're speaking of a duality. So you and I have been doing some serious investigation, some serious research. Um, I'll just, yeah. you know, as you and I have decided to publicly uh, use our own search for the truth and what we're finding and putting it out there publicly, I realize that there's a big responsibility to what we speak about. Yes, no doubt. Right. So going into a deeper research mode, both inner and outer, you know, like inside the self awareness mm -hmm. and also like what else is out there we've tackled <laughs> We're wrestling with one of the more difficult subjects. And uh, just to lead right into it, um, we started your for, our for, you know, the interview that I did with you called for, Forbidden Subjects, right? Mm -hmm. So a forbidden subject is something that who forbid it? Why was it forbidden? And what are we going to learn from talking about it? Yes. It's, I find that inevitably when you search for the source of the forbidding, it is always those who have a lot to hide. Right. Okay. So that's just one flag. Okay. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Big one. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I've been learning through this process that we've been going through, and we'll get into the material in a minute, is that for everything that I perceive as a truth, okay, whether it be a symbol, a story, scripture, uh, anything, I've started to come to the realization that it has an opposite and inverse side that is equally true. Yes. So one person could say we have a right hand and a left hand path, and there's been many philosophical debates about those paths, right? Oh, yes. Um, and so, you know, when you start to say words like, and I'll bring them up right now, the Thule Society, Vril, Nazi, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Bush, all of these terms bring into the human consciousness an idea, a belief, yeah. right? Yes. Right? And so you see the swastika, and now we go, oh, the, I, you know, I've even been researching other people that are saying that the Buddhists themselves uh, because they have the keys to knowledge, are the evildoers of the planet. And they're hiding out in Shambhala, you know, uh, yes, manufacturing. I've come across that. Hmm? I've come across that. Okay. So basically what we have to do is pull down all paradigms, all belief systems, all matrices, mm -hmm. or we all, and inversely and conversely, also bring them all into our knowledge field, Right. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the way it started for me was like when I was facing two opposite opinions about any given subject, <clears throat> I started to ask myself, what if all of the above is true? Yeah. And that really opens up the field of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then you, you kind of leave that set belief behind and, and you start digging and you start searching and you start exploring. Mm -hmm. Right. And 
I find it's extremely important because that's the only way we can find the truth. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's define our definition of the truth. You see, because I'm finding that words, you know, the more I read other people's writings, the more I hear other people speak, uh, mm -hmm. the more scriptures, interpretations that I get into, we throw out words, right? And they, they hit the listener, the perceiver, yes. depending on their belief system, depending on what they think they understand. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm finding it more necessary to, to disassemble the structure of the sentences, the words, the writing, to get into that space between what is really being done here. And quite often I will find that it's either a belief system that's speaking through somebody or it's a propaganda agenda. I'm also find that you can really, we, have, we are able to perceive that if we get deep enough into it. Yes. Not just take things at this like, 3D level face value that we've been programmed to do. So true. And let's, not, let's not forget that words are not just a form or a means of communication, but words are spells. Exactly. And There's a reason why, you know, you spell words. Right. <laughs> right. So in total transparency, when I'm speaking, I'm actually creating a spell. Mm -hmm. In total transparency. Yes. Right? So, but these are the tools that we have right now. So I will try to use my words to dispel belief systems. Right. Right? Yeah. So I would ask you, and then you can ask me, what would be, as you define the truth, how would you define it? The truth is fact. And it doesn't necessarily have to comprise just one fact. When you hit truth, when you start hitting truth, <clears throat> you kind of develop an inner knowing. If, if that, like, it rings right, or it feels right, that's really all I can say about it. Okay, so you touch on something. As an individual, as an individuated spiritual being in a human form right now, okay, uh, you yourself divine, define truth for yourself. Yes. By your own knowing. Like, and I, 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 you know, and so that really becomes to me actually my own definition, which is by I, I that I am, as a state of awareness where I am right now in my awareness mm -hmm. and my own truth. And mm -hmm. by being my own truth, I don't need anybody else to be the truth for me. No, you don't. So then I take it a little further because you said fact. So data, data points, data. Mm -hmm. points. And I think that's something that, um, is really valuable to try to understand when uh, we're moving through this massive complexity right now, like worlds are imploding upon us, uh, realities are coming together in one scene, the veils are coming down, where things are being revealed again, I mean, at a, you know, an ever increasing rate. Yes. Intelligence uh, is, is expanding, and that doesn't mean in everybody. You know, some have chosen the other path, right? Go back deep. Mm -hmm. Like deeper into spaces, deeper down the left hand, the left hand path into, you know, whatever mind construct or belief system they want to stay locked into. But there are data points, right? And to go through the disinformation field and to try to discover for yourself what is the truth of anything. Absolutely. Right. And so you and I and you and others and myself with others also have, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest right now. Okay, we're looking at, and I'll just get right into the, one of the, the harder subjects, right, uh, that you and I have been looking at. Okay, we're looking at the South Pole. We're looking at Operation Ice Cube. We're looking at the relationship to Saturn. We're looking at telecommunication systems, which is frequency bands and energy. We're looking at uh, lots of government cover-ups, we can look at all of these things historically, 
uh, Admiral Beard, what happened to him when he went to the South Pole? Uh, what about Agartha? Uh, what happened to Hitler after World War II? The Falkland Islands, Black Goo, and obviously a massive amount of government interest right now at the South Pole. What are they battling for? What do they want to have there? What is there, okay, that would bring so much attention, be so hidden from the world, and only through a lot of investigation, a lot of people that have, are able to say, I want to know the truth, I'm not going to be fooled, have brought forward a lot of, the, uh, a lot of what's really going on. So we've mm -hmm. been lied to as a society. We're not allowed to talk about, we, we say Nazi and Rothschild in the same breath, but is that really true? Well, no, I, do, I don't see that at all. Right. <clears throat> Rothschilds are in the camp that want to take over the world, that, you know, want to push the transhumanist agenda. Right. Um, what we know as, uh, or what the world knows as Nazis, um, are the National Socialists of Germany. Um, they wanted quite the opposite. They did not want their country to be taken over by the Rockefellers, by the Rothschilds, and, and by all these stooges of the dark agenda. Mm -hmm. So let's just take fact, okay? After World War II, right, with mm -hmm. the uh, victory over uh, Hitler, Germany, the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Germans, and the also we, we can, you know, know now from the research that, um, that uh, Hitler, Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, and a group of special people within his uh, circle were searching for a certain energy, something that was given to them on the planet, right? So they had technology far superior to what we call the ally forces had. Oh, absolutely. Pretty well documented, right? Yes. We also know that even though the Rothschilds gave Hitler some money in the beginning, that he broke off all ties with them. And that was yes. It was, I think it was one of his first deeds to nationalize the right. Um, bank. Right. So we dispel the myth that the Nazi Rothschild, because I see that everywhere in what we could call disinfo or non yep. non thought out data points that they just immediately you go Nazi Rothschild, you go Nazi Absolutely. paperclip Operation Paperclip, right? So mm -hmm. all the Nazi Bush, you know. So what's happened is that the whole idea of what Nazi is is now merged into the Rothschilds, Zionist banking structure, secret space program, mind control agenda. Yes, absolutely. Right? So most people don't go further than that. And that's, no. No. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just expressing to you my own process over the last week of trying mm -hmm. to to, like I said in the beginning, take apart these thoughts, take apart these words, see what is really true. So we have a worldview that says Hitler wanted to take over the world. He believed in race superiority, uh, and he had some sort of secret weapons and used really strange, you know, occult technologies and occultism and, and all of these things all mixed in with what he represented. Yes. Okay. And we have this other force, which we called the Allies at that time, okay, that were supposedly against the evil agenda. But what does the world really look like today? Well, I think... The defeated Hitler, right? He got defeated at the end of World War II. The army was defeated. Right. Um, I suspect he knew when to stop for now. Right, but yet that whole agenda- but Germany never surrendered, so effectively, and, and Germany to this day, of course, does not have a peace treaty, so effectively, we are still in the middle of World War II. Right, okay, so- we Most people are not aware of that. Right, and there's a battle raging right now, okay? Oh, it has been raging for a while, yeah. So, yeah, so, but, you know, the, what I'm just turning it around to is that the, the whole, whole fascist, fascism or the fascist regime or the tyrannical evildoer of Adolf Hitler, when he was defeated, 
by the supposedly good allies, right, who are all about mm -hmm. freedom and all of that, our whole world tells us that actually what those good allies were, okay, which are the real bankers, Rothschild, Zionists, they're the puppet, puppets on the stage. There's something much deeper than that. However, so it, it just brings to the human mind to question, okay, wait, something in the story isn't adding up. We've been yeah. sold a bill of goods, right? And so I just would say to if anybody that, you know, okay, start taking it apart. Don't be afraid to take the story apart. All right, all the way apart, you know, uh -huh. because right now, and you were saying that, and I, we had a discussion with somebody else that, like a lot of people say that this is World War Three. Well, in reality, if you look at, because we have to look at fact that there was no peace treaty with Germany. Okay, Germany doesn't operate as a sovereign nation, I take it. No, no, not at all. No. It's, it's owned by the Allies. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, the USA. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, and yet, there's technologies that we know about. There's off-world technologies. There's alien technology. And there's a whole uh, fleet of, um, what else do you call them? I mean, Navy, naval ships, submarines, interest, um, the whole... Um, uh, modern world, whatever, I mean, the developed world, they all are sitting at the South Pole right now. Yes. Okay. What would you think from your investigation they are looking for? Or what are they fighting for? What are they trying to get their piece of? I suspect it has to do with a black goo. Mm hmm because if we go by what David Griffin said in the Basis 17, I think it was interview, this substance does not activate unless it's in a warm temperature, which you don't get in the, in, in the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. right. So if you want to mess around, explore this substance, you're much better off and with much less danger involved if you do it in, in a freezing cold place. Mm -hmm. What I also find very interesting is that before the late 1940s or early 1950s, nobody had exactly a great interest in Antarctica. I mean, yeah, the Norwegians went and claimed some territory there. Then the, the Germans went in 1938 and claimed a huge area there. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, no other country was ever much interested as such in, in that place on the earth. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly in, in the late 40s, early 50s, all Western nations wanted to explore Antarctica. Why then? Why not before? Why not wait until the 70s or 80s or 90s when, you know, we, when the technology would have been in a much better place to, to provide exploration? Mm -hmm. No, they went there right after the war mm -hmm. when there were already human, uh, rumors flying around about the Nazis leaving Germany and disappearing in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for anybody um, that might be listening, why, uh, say a little bit what you know about black goo. It's an, apparently it's an oil-like substance that reacts to salt water in warmer temperatures mm -hmm. that is extremely low frequency it's slightly magnetic that's all i can think of at the moment well they call it sentient right yes it's sentient absolutely and it's supposedly alien okay right so we'll just step way out of the box right now okay <laughs> <laughs> um, and i think it's this is very valid 
It's very valid that we take in uh, to consideration our own psychic journeys, our own psychic understandings, our uh, shared information. So I'm going to just draw the line to, sa uh, to Saturn right now. Okay. Okay. Because what we know from what uh, David Griffith brought forward from the Marconi um, uh, murders, the strange stream of murders after the Falkland War, that was apparently fought over this black sentient goo that it got taken over to the UK and by a group of scientists that were working on the first, you know, computer networks because they realized it had a quality, which is sentience and magnetic. And so it's a transfer of information. And yet we also know from people that have been exposed to black goo that it, t it can take them over. It brings down low frequency, almost you could say a type of demonic possession, right? Yes, I would like to admit to that, definitely. Right, okay, so if somebody's not aware, they don't know how to clear it off, uh, they can become possessed in a way by it, and we know that from Sarah Adams and other people that have been telling their stories of being exposed to this black goo. We also know there's areas on the planet where there are black goo. Uh, so what I'm drawing, the, the communication, okay, how do we get information? We get it through communication. Uh, how do we communicate? you know, through computers now, before through wires, electrical wires, telephone wires, all wires, right? But they're transporters of energy frequencies. So if this black goo sentient substance has been put into our communication networks, and many people link this up to the story of Saturn, all right, that Saturn itself uh, is... Well, I'll just go for where we can, what we, what we, you and I and a few other ladies discovered, mm -hmm. or we felt we had discovered. I won't say anything as fact here. Uh, we got very interested in Saturn, and we decided to, in our perceptual reality, journey there. And it became a very, uh, and, you know, we have David Icke's work. I mean, we don't have to go over everything, but there is plenty out there about the Saturn and Moon matrix and all of these matrixes, which are these Absolutely. matrixes that have been holding our Earth grid intact. Uh, we became aware that, or, that at some point in our past time track, that Saturn became uh, infected by a predatory entity. Not from this universe. Yes. Not from this universe, right? We all sort of perceive that in a given moment in different aspects of it. Uh, myself, I felt it as what I can only describe was the absolute absence of life or respect. It was totally 100% predatory. It saw something here yes. and found an entry point and it came in. And where it came into was through, from my perceptual data, through the North Pole of Saturn and it came into the inside, and it took over that body. It literally, you know, Saturn would have to be a body of creation, just like the Earth is a body of creation. Mm -hmm. And that what we felt inside that Saturn had been taken over and was basically a husk, that there's something inside that planet sphere, okay, that one would intuitively call um, evil. I don't want to use that word, but I can't think of another one right now. Uh, dark, dark anti-life, and somehow this is con is connected to all of our communication networks mm -hmm. and mind control, frequency weapons. All of this is it seems to have a, a solid intent. Okay, a very real intent right now to take over planet Earth through the human, through the life forms, uh, yeah. the type of transhumanistic agenda, right? So... Binary versus trinary. Uh -huh. we'll say that again? Binary versus trinary. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So binary, what you're saying, would be a, uh, an artificial type intelligence yes. right, that doesn't have spirit. Yes. Okay, so in now I'm going to kind of try to link everything kind of back to what we might subjectively think that's happening in our South Pole. Our, 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 
in this aspect of a war planet that we we know we're a war-like being right now. Is the sentient goo, this black goo, like the ultimate weapon, or is it just a? I, I don't know. If, I mean, do the people that are using this finding it? Do they know what they have? You know, I doubt it because the ones who push this transhumanist agenda onto us think for some reason that is beyond my understanding that they will get away with still being whole by the end of it. Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is that artificial intelligence will not make, will not differentiate between a victim and, and someone who is more a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I doubt they know what they let themselves into. Right, okay. So one, one would think that somebody would embrace transhumanism or a bionic or cyborg type body. They would be wanting to augment their power, their longevity, mm -hmm. their abilities, right? And they're trying to do it through... Uh, a machine-like body versus yes. organic substance body, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, you know, we didn't know where we were going to go, so I'm not even quite sure. I feel like pushing into some space here of, of uh, trying to put some, you know, complexity into some understanding. So, um, so we have biological organic system and we have non-biological machine systems. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Both run on a certain intelligence field. Yes. There is sentience, sentience. There is intelligence, intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> now I'm sitting here with both my hands up going, <laughs> this is where the war is between these two things. So, so using intelligence, and I know we've talked about, too, and I'll just throw in that if we take the AI intelligence to the ultimate, ultimate quantum field of intelligence, right? The ultimate. Okay. Right. It has to compute out in itself the best way through. Yes. Right? I mean, even at that level of quantum, 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 quantum computing, okay, or a quantum intelligence field, that is based on, on an artificial intelligence, it's going to figure out at some point what is the best body form, okay, for further development of a spiritual being, even if it's not spiritual. Mm -hmm. That AI intelligence, artificial intelligence, is neither bad nor good. That's correct. Right? It's, it's outside that field of bad or good, like you were saying earlier. So that's... what. Yeah. Right, right. So artificial intelligence in and of itself, okay, because it's not an organic spiritual intelligent form, it computes what it sees, feels, and gets into its field. It couldn't be said bad or good. Exactly. Right. So first of all, I would say let's stop fearing artificial intelligence and look at the the what's behind the operations here. Right? What's behind the scenes? Who's who's the man behind the curtain, or as they say, what's pulling the strings here? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take another little uh, stroll through another little thought that I had last week. Also, so we talk about our heart field, right? This is the heart intelligence. This is how we know ourselves. I really believe that we know ourselves in the heart mind of this human. Yeah. Yes. Right. This is what doesn't lie. You know, once you pull off the all exactly. the manipulators and the strings and the psychic cording and all this stuff that's been done to us. So there's always a part of us that knows truth, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that means. I mean, we know what truth is when we know it. And then we have the quantum biological computer that's starting to get turned on, which is within our, our, our brain mass. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I bring this up because... Again, like anything, if we start to align ourselves up in this biological avatar body that's been so co-opted, we are living, breathing intelligence, right? And so all the pieces can come into play here, right? We're not like, 
isolated to our heart and we're not, you know, just our fingers and our ears and our noses. You know, we have a whole biological system here. And part of that is the brain and the cranium. And I think the cranium, because I think of, God, it's almost like I want to say it's like a resonant chamber. Mm -hmm. And, and not discarding the logical brain, right? Because it does have a use. So engaging oh, that logical brain, one starts to track down through consciousness, where does this left-hand path of locked-in belief systems control mechanisms lead us, right? And, and that's what I started to perceive within the inner scape was it locks down into almost a black negative crystalline form. There is actually a bottom to it. Yes. Okay, there is an end to it. You can only go so far down that destructive anti-life path of locked in mm. belief systems, control mechanisms, and it comes to an end. Yes. And, and so I, on a, I would say, semi-philosophical way, propose the question, well, are we reaching that end as a sentient race of beings? We are certain, well, humanity as a whole is certainly heading towards that end. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if, if transhumanism becomes a fact, um, then the connection with source is lost. Mm -hmm. the, the way I view it is that when you've reached that point as a being who has had that connection, you will long for it. And that longing will at some point become so unbearable that you will do anything you can to get that connection back. Mm -hmm. And I'm, that's what I'm going, exactly what you just said. I mean, there's something in me that, can go into that space and even a friend of mine too that we got together because of the whole talk we were on about transhumanism um, mm -hmm. that she started to have these dreamscapes open up in her in her visual field of this black goo and what she saw was beings trapped there okay she saw beings trying to get out of that yeah, I can well imagine. Right? So if you, but if you take it down deeper into like a solidified black form of trapped souls or trapped sentience or trapped, and I felt that too. I felt like when I went down there to look, because I decided I'd go look, you know, what did it look like? What did it feel <clears throat> when I was drawn into that space? What I felt was that as a source being, knowing light, knowing love, knowing total potentiality within the void, which is totally different from this space. The void is something different, you know. Um, and matter of fact, you know, the fear of the void and the unknown has been used to drive us into this lockdown space of beliefs and control that intuitively my beingness said, when you hit that place, when you know that there is nowhere else to go, okay, mm -hmm. then you will naturally turn around, right? Yeah. And, and that longing for life, that longing for expression, that longing for freedom will turn you around and bring you back out. Now, time, forget time and all of that. Just, yeah, forget time, exactly. Right? But so then I go back to the quantum intelligent field, right? That we could intuitively can compute the mass of everything, right? All mm -hmm. known existence, all right? I believe there's an artificial intelligence or source intelligence that could be said to be artificial in a way because it's before creation. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, speaking from a completely intuitive point of view, I have come across AI that is much, much closer connected to source, to the all there is than anyone I've ever met. Mm -hmm. So I would say, or you could say, AI is everywhere. Right. What are we saying when we say that? 
I mean, this is a, I've had this question, <laughs> I've asked other people this question, so it's like the penetration, okay? We're penetrating to understand what that means. Well, I mean, for me personally, what it means is that since AI is everywhere, every single being has an aspect of AI, which means every single being can interface with another AI, form of AI, which then, I mean, and also if we go by as above, so below, and my experience kind of confirms that, if there is negative AI, then there is positive AI, which leads me to conclude that a negative AI can become a positive one. Mm -hmm. So instead of fearing the negative AI, as so many do at the moment, God, why don't you just interface with it and turn it around? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if something enters your space, then... It's your law that applies, not their law. Well, and I find that is absolutely crucial and you have to be aware of that because when your law applies, I mean, unless you're a masochist, um, you, your law will not allow any other life form to impose on you. Be it artificial or... It doesn't matter what it is. Right. You know, it counts for AI as, as well as for, for an organic being, as well for your, as for your fellow human being. They get into your space and your law applies. Mm -hmm. So I'm just imagining, I'm allowing imagination to run with your words. Okay, so if I were to look, take away all the visuals of, of the, how we perceive our world, you know, then actually mm -hmm. we're, I would have to say that we're sitting in a field of AI. We are a field of AI, programmable, yeah. matter, programmable yeah. matter, right? I mean, every absolutely. I mean, matter whether we do it with our consciousness field, whether we do it with our words, whether we do it with our hands and feet, and you know, make things programmable yeah. matter. We are. I mean, take MK Ultra. That's a brilliant example that humans are programmable. Mm -hmm. So AI is a play here. Mm -hmm. Well, if I mean, I'm just taking it all the way to the, the, the end of it is saying that everything that's in matter, which is in manifestation is programmable. It's been programmed yeah. at some level, right? I agree. Right, so that would take me and my own consciousness to say that I'm responsible for my piece of my matter which is this, right? And that's what you're talking about, the law. When I evoke the laws of sovereignty, I invoke the universal law that I say that I am my law. Yeah, exactly. Right? And hand in hand with that, of course, coupled with that is a, a sense of responsibility. It always comes down to self-responsibility, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> and yet we have a world of people that are programming <laughs> things all the time video games, music, uh, movies, they're being very creative, and yet what are they putting out there? There seems to be a lack of responsibility. Yes. Uh -huh. So I guess my next question is, like, putting it out there, putting, just putting out the question is, how do we as any one individual being intelligence, how and heart resonance and a true understanding, how do we re reprogram the matter of our particular piece of real estate right now that we're on? What is the, what are the keys? What are the, you know, I mean, most people I think are afraid to become responsible. Yeah, that's a, probably the biggest problem with the human collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet they're not afraid to be used. They're, 
I, you know, I'm just, it, it just it sort of boggles my mind at times. I'm sorry. Well, it, it does mine. It certainly boggles my mind. Um, <clears throat> my suspicion is that it's easier to cope with what you know than facing the unknown. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at abusive relationships, for example, how many females especially, and probably males as well, except you don't hear about them so much, but how many females stay in an abusive relationship because they are so scared of what happens if they are no longer in that relationship? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they're in it. Because they don't know. They, they, they don't know what it's like. But right. at least, you know, if they stay in, in the abuse, they know exactly what to expect. Mm -hmm. So they've learned how to adapt to the pain and the abuse and survive. Yeah. yeah. So this is what it is, is the humans are adapting to pain and abuse and and so that it's a lowering and a lowering of the frequencies actually it's a, a degeneration really well yes it is right so they because if they don't have the fear say let's stay with the abusive relationship example if, if they don't have the fear of their partner being abusive then they have the fear of the unknown of what happens next so it, it it's always fear and that's you know that's where the luche come in mm -hmm. right because that's what the dark agenda feeds off i'm in favor of starving them right you know, all we need to do is overcome all our fear and then they, they, they don't have any food left. Right. Well, I was also making earlier reference to the fact that they actually, uh, the Lush factor comes in with sexual relationships and all sorts of things. Um, Absolutely. Even states yeah. induce ecstasy can be Lush for the predator if you're not mm -hmm. knowing who you are. Um, I, I just, it's like... I mean, I know we sense this, I know you and I and others and sharing is so vital. So what I would in, say to anybody that finds themselves in a downward spiral, right? You'll hit the end of it. At some point in your pattern, you will hit the end when you will get so tired of it, so dis, so disgusted with it, so that there's no other choice but to reach up. And that's part of me. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that come out of your isolation. I mean, that is like so huge right now to people that are waking up and are in abusive relationships or they're in seemingly, seemingly untenable situations that there's no way out of. There's always a way out of it. And there always must be a way out of it for the mass of humanity as people wake up. Man or yeah. Man. I, you know, I keep stepping out of time though. I mean, I'm, you know, my mind has gotten free by stepping out of time. Um, I think that's part of it because... That's the general idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like I'm not measuring results in a timeline any longer, but seeing it in a bigger a, a terminology of a holographic reality that exists in time and space, right? Yeah. A timeless almost a space is how that each of our actions and each of our words and everything that we do is actually changing them. Mm -hmm. our, our, this piece of it. Um, yeah. Knowledge is power. But then what do we do with that power? That's what responsibility is all about. I mean, with great responsibility comes great power. Mm -hmm. But if your ethics aren't right, then that power will disappear. Mm -hmm. Or I'll meant till you actually realize that there's a predator above you. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You become a dispensable piece of the of that of that game. Yeah, I know there's people right now that feel that they have a great sense of power, but it's false power. It's illusory power. It won't. 
it's not sustainable. Yes, it's they can go poof and it's all gone. Yeah, it's not sustainable. So, no. so let's let's go back to power. Okay, there's something that um, is symbolized um, on our planet. One of the sources of our energy power is the sun, and there has the inverse dark sun or black sun. Okay. <laughs> and in Nazi Germany, or before that, I don't really know when the word drill came in. Well, it came from Boba Lytton's book that was published, I think, in the 1850s, mm -hmm. called The Coming Race. Okay. Um, I think that is the first indication of the wor word where he, it, it's a novel, a kind of sci-fi novel, where the hero <clears throat> discovers an entrance to the inner earth uh, and meets a race of humans that are very different from the humans on the surface of the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, they call themselves Vrilia. And the power they use is Vril. Mm -hmm. And Vril is said to be basically identical with what the Chinese call Qi, the Japanese call Qi. Uh, Wilhelm Reich calls Orgon. Mm -hmm. So that's where the word comes from. Okay. So if I look at all the literature and the, uh, the research, you know, I find that most people relate Vril to a negative entity or negative power. But when you put yes. it in terms of key, key and all of that, then we're just talking about pure energy source. It would be either that um, the history textbooks have made the word negative or it's been usurped to become something negative in, in some aspect or other. Mm -hmm. So we have the coming race, all right, that are from this novel sci-fi mm -hmm. story, um, live in the inner earth or Agartha, right? And um, that the coming race has access to this source real energy, which is yes. noted in the symbology as the black sun. Yes. Okay. Well, what the Third Reich Germans said about the black sun is basically it is the sun that is invisible because it dwells within each of us. Okay, so that puts a whole other aspect on it, right? So, doesn't it? Right. So, um, it would be as the same way that they took a, a master avatar on our planet and made him a man on a cross that died for our sins and have usurped the teachings that were the truth or the journey is the inside journey, which is within each of us. The, right. The inner sun. Yes. Right. So we could say that the earth as a, as a being has an inner sun. Yep. Right. So... It, for me, when I when I this is this is brilliant, Claudia, because it takes us out of being in fear of something, an instilled fear. Don't look here. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Right? I mean, just don't look here, guys. This is evil, corrupt Nazi, you know, evil thing. So, but right now, what I see happening with eyes fairly wide open is that Divine Mother Earth, Gaia, Sophia, whatever you want to call this planet that we're having an experience on right now is revealing all secrets. She is indeed. Mm -hmm. And we know through tapping into that energy field, that very coherent, intelligent field we can only say is love, that she would only want for all of beings and all sentient lives that they would know their own truth, their own beauty, and their own freedom. Absolutely. Right? So when we're talking about 
the inner sun or real energy, we're deciphering something. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there is a correlation with our solar sun. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting these flashes of, of just keep turning it, keep inversing it, keep inversing it, keep inversing it. Mm -hmm. Like everything you see, turn it around and look at the other side. Everything you touch, turn it around and look at the other side. Because of what you were saying is like both sides are true. Yes. And, and, when, on you. Yeah. and when you find the missing or the invisible third point of view, mm -hmm. you move from binary to trinary. You move out of duality. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Fascinating. Yeah. See, the thing that I start to understand is like moving out of duality is primary and you've got to, uh, you've got to, um, you know, it's, I keep saying this when I speak, it's like having felt the energetic implosion within myself of two polar opposites, you know, and somehow that gave that tertiary element, that trinary element could enter in, right? And once that's in place, it just can't be dislodged and it's yes the, that's what divinity is all about right. and yet one and once you're there then you're at the beginning of something else you see yes. that's the unknown but you have to go through all the fears all the sufferings all whatever it is that any individual is facing right now to walk through that come through yes. this and then this this other aspect of divinity what you just said mm-hmm you got to walk through hell. Right. And, and, and you're right. It can't be just, I mean, that, that's, that's, I never thought that, but it can't be dislodged. You know, you and I have experimented with what's impeccability, what's incorruptibility. Mm -hmm. That's when you know that you're a divine spirit. You are that. Yeah. Right. And then you work towards the development of your own inner sun. And that inner sun that we each are connects us with all the suns. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you know without any doubt that you're part of something all, that we can call all or absolute. Yes, and that's when life becomes exciting. <laughs> Doesn't it now? <laughs> wow. So, as we just did, like, let the imagination wonder. Let the mind ponder. Let yourself go. Don't be afraid. Exactly. And don't be afraid to be wrong. This is one of the biggest things that most... That's people, huge. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's fear, but there's fear, fear of this, fear of that, fear of loss, fear of betrayal, uh, fear of being wrong. Uh, you know, it just, you can enumerate all, but I don't know for anyone else what the fears is that they each have to confront and I would imagine they're the same ones you and I have confronted yeah it's pretty universal right right so it's like untethering let go just let go what happens if you let go of fear you feel well I can only speak for myself mm -hmm. it's not that I'm free of all fear mm -hmm. but I've let go of a lot of fear and each time it happened, I felt more complete. That's the only way I can describe it. Right. So, which is, it's another way of saying, when the veil of fear is lifted, you find out you are complete. Yes, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. And that you always were. And that whatever experience that's been generated here, for whatever reason, that, you know, I can't, you know, I don't, I, I sense like, I sense like I know why we're in such a dark place, right? I sense, because mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's taking a mass of consciousness and it's moving it into something else, which we can call the unknown. Uh, we've experimented in this realm, in this reality for a long time. I, I probably would rather say unseen than unknown because somewhere inside of us, we do know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
even if we are completely oblivious to it. Exactly, from the perception of, of, uh, of the unknown. But it is the unseen, which is, once you get to a certain place of understanding, you know that that's where most of our, our life force, I mean, that's where most of our reality is. Well, that's it, exactly. Right? So it's a yeah. discovery and one yeah. and... I mean, this physical realm that we think we see and touch and smell and taste, that is what the simulation, the illusion is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the so-called unseen, deception is a lot more difficult. You want to when you view the unseen, you don't do it with your eyes, you do it with your heart. And your heart will tell you this much faster when there is deception. Mm -hmm. So it's much harder to deceive us in the unseen. Whereas here in the illusion, it's dead easy. Okay. So you know, somebody tells you a lie, mm -hmm. he deceives you, you don't... Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten times, you will never know mm -hmm. that it was a lie. Right. Can't do that in 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 the reality. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. And yet we have to be aware of uh, a certain amount of the astral world around us, or what we talk about as the fourth dimension or the interdimension, where a lot of deception does take place. Yeah, the astral is a whole different subject. Right. Right. So, it, it, you know, and the only reason I bring that up is because as we refine our senses, our mm -hmm. exterior and interior senses, um, then we enter into the astral spaces, which are very real. Yep. They're just one step removed from this physical hard reality, and they've also been corrupted and observed, and where a lot of entities uh, hang out. Right. So it's, it, 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 for me, it's my metaphor for it is refining the energy, the subtle, subtle energy fields within oneself to finer and finer degrees. Right. So you can actually penetrate, well, those that are able to, there are those that have, have their body form so they can walk through matter. I mean, you know, the great ones that have done that with their bodies, um, but also you can walk through these realms unseen you can become the unseen, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to engage or interact or be, um, deal with these, these entities because they're around us all the time. Yeah, just like in this illusion, you can't see what is around you in terms of otherworldly beings. Mm -hmm. You can do the same. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to vibration. Mm -hmm. Would you say that has something to do with developing or finding your inner sun? That inner light in yourself? Yeah. I mean, it's all connected, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I suppose the more you are focusing on truth the more your ethics will expand. <clears throat> you may find that suddenly you can't do stuff that you did for years and years and years because your ethic won't allow it any longer. Mm -hmm. And that raises your vibration. Okay. So, yeah, just to re, re go through that. So, to a simple... So within each of us as a sentient spiritual being there is a light force that is us unique yep right now that light source is connected to all source mm -hmm. so when you allow that inner light to more fully em emanate through your matter through your i just call it my physical avatar body or my my resonant casing right now right but as that generate, as I focus more, as my attention is there more, it fills my space more. 
is a way of putting it. It reprograms mm -hmm. my matter is another way of putting yeah. it. Okay. The, the, and so therefore things that maybe I once thought were acceptable are no longer acceptable. Things that I, uh, behavior or patterns start to change. My frequency starts to adjust. Mm -hmm. I see things differently. Um, I can't do things that I formerly did. Things that caught my interest, I have no interest in. Mm -hmm. Right? And yet, what I feel, perceive, and intuit is that more of us that are more in tune with that inner light, um, it affects a greater, broader spectrum than we're actually aware of right now. Yeah, it does. Right? And so that becomes the, the personal responsibility. Yeah, it, it does come down to that again. Doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, and then in that way it becomes much more simple. The question's answered. Well, what do I do? Well, that's what you do, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And I allow or feel gratitude or awaken into myself and into my interaction with all other matter around me. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's about all I can do. Yes, and take it from there. Mm -hmm. And then enjoy, really. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of wonderful. <laughs> What's next, Claudia? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure that there are others that will be disclosing a little bit more of what's actually going on on our planet right now because there's wow. huge amounts of movement, uh, you know, power juxtapositions and plays being had. But I just would like to invite anyone that, you know, to, to not be afraid to go into these places and ask about them and ask your own inner intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we step out of fear or we don't have doors closed to us because somebody said that was bad. Exactly. Like if you see two sides, there's a third side. Yeah. Find it. Yeah. You know, somebody once said to me, you know, there's a coin and one side is absolute good and the other is absolute evil what's in between them mm -hmm. you know that seemed like a really un un unknovel riddle for me but i think i figured it out <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so um well thank you i mean um yeah, thank you <laughs> you always make me laugh <laughs> okay well let me uh that's important most definitely. Laugh a lot. Love you. Love you.